Welcome. I am so glad that you're here to uh, accompany me as I tell you about my experiences being a tarantula keeper during my first year in the hobby. I have made a list of things that I'm going to talk about and I hope that there's something in here that you find useful and uh, that is my intention. So uh, also have any other questions, leave them below and I'll answer them in the comments. But uh, let's just get started. This is not going to be in any particular order. So uh, just these are just things that have come up that, that really struck me as things that uh, stood out that I've really grown and learned from. So here we go. So the first year, um, there is a question about old worlds and beginner species and what uh, is a suitable beginner species. And everyone has an opinion about this. There are varied, varied opinions, of course. Some people say, you know, do what you're comfortable with. Other people say, you know, start out slow. Some people do start out slow and they work their way up over several years. I um, went on a fast track where I did get my first old world after about two, five, five or six months into uh, my experience. My first old world that I ended up getting was a female king baboon and she is about five and a half inches or so and she was of course um, that size when I got her. And I was warned that she was really mean and that I should take precautions. The person who had her uses used to use a metal colander to place over her when he rehoused her. And, you know, he asked me if I was sure that I wanted her. And I said yes. And I will say that there was a little bit of hesitation. And a lot of that comes from, you know, my own fears, also from things that I had seen in groups and, you know, posts about old worlds and about certain species. And there does tend to be some, uh, you know, hype. I would call it hype now at this point about some of the tarantulas. And the things really are taken, you know, over, over, overkill a bit sometimes. Um, but there are exceptions to that, and I will mention that later. So my first old world was a king baboon, Pelinobius muticus. She's absolutely beautiful. She stays down in her burrow. She's in a five-gallon aquarium with a lot of substrate, and I basically poke her food down there, and I see her legs, and I pull out her molts, and... Um, yeah, she's pretty fabulous though. Um, so there, there, there's something that I want to say uh, about old worlds, and that is that I have learned not to get too comfortable. I had an experience the other day where, you know, this really was what I needed to kind of open my eyes again and be like, don't be so lax, you know, really know that your animals are unpredictable. And of course that goes for old world and new world. But I was uh, feeding my Ornithoctonus aureotibialis, um, that is the Thai gold fringed uh, tarantula. And I dropped a little wax worm into it's a little funnel burrow and it shot out of there like a slingshot and you know it could have just kept going it could have gone you know right off the edge of of the um critter keeper that it was in and catapulted itself right into my face had it wanted to it all happened very quickly uh it was unexpected um and you know so just be prepared for that um but it isn't like that happens all the time. That's actually the first time that that has happened to me in a year. So um, it can be easy to get comfortable and expect that it's not gonna happen. The biggest thing that I feel that I've learned about tarantulas 
and, and and this is based on my own experiences and what my fears were my fears were you know of course handling them getting them from one location to another things like that they feel safe in their homes so if you give them an enclosure that has enough substrate for the species it has a nice hide they have what they need and they're settled in there they are much calmer and and so much easier you know um, less likely to bolt which isn't to say that it, it won't happen because it, it can I did have a little uh, campus curia geniculata that I took um, the lid off of the critter keeper to uh, film this one and it was in pre-molt. I dropped some food in there and it bolted right out the top uh, and in and up the back of the chair. So that was not something I expected but when they are in pre-molt they can be unpredictable because they don't want to be bothered so if something comes into their burrow it can startle them and they might leave. Now that has actually happened to me on more than one occasion. That is, that is just something that I feel very strongly about. I want them to feel safe. And I, I really have to say that I do cringe sometimes when I see on the internet that people are keeping um, a tarantula in conditions where it has nowhere to hide. Uh, the substrate is just not adequate and, and they really don't, they don't feel safe, you know, and so um, I, I don't see m mine as much as some people do because I am not um, I'm not feeding them in the open and keeping them in such a way that they have really hardly anywhere to go. They will come out if they want to. So I consider it to be a real treat if I see them. There's a question: um, What has been the toughest time of the year? And after going from December of 2017 to right now it's May, tomorrow is May 1st of 2019. I have to say that winter is the toughest time of year. You know, it's okay if it gets really warm. Um, I can handle that. I just will, will cut back on how much I'm spraying some of the enclosures and how humid it is getting because I, you know, you don't want them to be too humid. But Winter time is tough because the heater just leaches all of the humidity out of the air. It gets bone dry. So the substrate, of course, gets bone dry. So in the winter time, I found myself misting substrate, sometimes on a daily basis. And, you know, there's also the worry of what happens if the heat, if something happens to the power. You know, do you have a, a backup generator? I went through this winter and I didn't have one, but by this next winter, I want to have a generator and I will run an extension cord um, to a heater into my tarantula room if I have to, because that's one of my biggest fears. But uh, anyway, that, that was the biggest challenge was keeping the tarantulas hydrated. And I really had to, I really had to stay on top of it. I couldn't just, you know, ignore them for for four or five days. So if I do go on vacation during the winter time, I'm going to have to have someone, um, you know, check on them and make sure that they have water because it also evaporates out of their water bowls very quickly. Now, you know, some people will, will rely on not having water bowls at all, but I don't feel comfortable with that and I can tell you why. One of the reasons is that I'm human and, you know, I make mistakes and sometimes things happen. So if there's a point during the winter time when the heater is causing, you know, excessive dryness, it's very possible that I could miss someone and not water them or something could happen and I could be in the hospital or who knows, there's just things that happen. So if, if that gets bone dry, um, the tarantula can become dehydrated. They do get dehydrated and it does kill them. And yes, maybe in the wild, they, uh, there are desert species and they um, are said to be in their burrows for months and this sort of thing. But the, the, the planet and the earth and being outside in those conditions is far different than what we are replicating in these little enclosures inside of our, inside of our dry, <laughs> you know, heated house. 
And I think that that can contribute to um, loss of hydration and death very quickly. The room that I have them in for winter time, it's insulated. I don't want a lot of drafts um, in there. So I do have a heavy curtain I keep closed. Um, and I have, uh, I, I am very aware of, you know, where the heater vent is and who's close to it. And uh, my roach bin is there. So that gives me an indication of how dry it is because that'll just dry out really quickly. Um, and I have plastic over, there's a, these double doors that are uh, glass sliding doors and I just have plastic over those so it's very secure. If a tarantula escapes, they can't go into the wall or anything like that. And it keeps the heat circulating in the room. And as far as if it gets too stuffy in there, then I open the door, I let some, you know, I let uh, some air circulate in there and I also can turn down the thermostat. In the springtime, I've noticed now that humidity has increased a lot in the tarantula room. Another way to increase humidity is if you have other animals, like I have um, a millipede tank and I have two uh, uh, knoll tanks, um, I have a crested gecko, and they all like humidity. So those tanks have live plants in them. They are um, vivariums. They have isopods in them and other things, and they stay very, very wet. And this has helped increase the humidity, uh, probably more so than it was during the winter. Um, bad experiences with purchases. I really haven't had a lot of bad experiences um, other than this recent, you know, trying to get some female anoles from snakes at sunset. Yeah, no, very bad. Um, don't even, they don't communicate. They didn't send them. They said they sent them, but they didn't. It couldn't have been worse, really. I'm just glad they didn't send them because, uh, yeah, who knows. But as far as in the tarantula community, there hasn't been anything. There was one, um, there was one time I purchased a female Fiza, female Brachypelma hemori turned out to be male, but the seller, you know, more than compensated and compensated me and was more than generous about it. So that was all cleared up. So everything there has been really good. And uh, I've, I've shopped at several different places. Um, I've, I've, I've bought from Jamie's. I've bought from Ken the Bug Guy. I've bought from Arachnoiden. I've bought from Palp Friction, Fear Not. The only place that, you know, is well known that I haven't bought anything from is um, Pinchers and Pokies. I've never tried them. And at Nature's Exquisite Creatures, I haven't bought anything from them either. And also Netbug. Uh, I've, I've purchased a few times from there as well. So those have all been great experiences. I even think once um, in the beginning I, I did uh, purchase from Underground. And other than a little bit of the packaging, you know, the, they were in vials with loose ver vermiculite. And I didn't, I didn't like that. But other than that, everything went well. Their communication was good. The feeder insects, as far as you know, what I feed, what I feed my tarantulas over the last year, I decided to start my own feeder insect colonies, and I started with um, red runners. And at first, I was kind of like, oh, you know, they're not really reproducing much, and it was a little bit of a challenge. So I started this project where I kept track of how many egg cases I got every day and uh, how many hatched every day. And I did that for several months to try and keep track. And then it event eventually, I moved them into a very large, very, very large um, Tupperware, uh, like a big container. And it was, it's not a clear container. It's um, dark blue. So it's very dark in there. They have, um, sub they have substrate in the bottom. They have a lot of egg crates and I give them um, my dog's food along with some fruits and vegetables and I've had an explosion of babies now. So I have so many red runners I don't even know what to do with them. And dubias, I started raising dubias. Now it took probably nine months or so before they really took off and recently here I did sell a couple hundred of those to a friend but uh, that was about all that I could afford to um, giveaway at that point. So those have been my two main sources and then sometimes I buy wax worms 
I don't use crickets much anymore, even though in the beginning crickets were what I was farming and I made a video about it. It's just that they're they're not as they're not as easy and I don't like the risk of them going in and chewing on the tarantulas while they're molting. I was really worried about roaches. I especially the red runners, I was worried about them escaping and getting all over the house, but you know, here we are over a year in and there's no roaches in the house. So I've tried to be meticulous about that. They, you know, they don't they don't climb as well as some of the of the other roaches, so I haven't had them escape out of that bin. Um, experience is brought to me by being in the hobby. Now, having a tarantula at all was something I never imagined I'd be doing, and I love experiences like that. I'm a person who, for a very long time, I have told myself, you can never say never because I've seen so many people just say. I would never do that. And I just think in my head, well, you're no fun. I mean, because you never know. There are circumstances that can cause a person to change. You never know what it's going to be. It could, it might take something extreme. It, maybe it would, you know. Um, but it can happen. Uh, and so I, I just try to embrace it and learn what I can. And uh, this just couldn't have come at a better point in my life because I was really feeling particularly challenged and particularly low in my personal life and I needed something to hold on to and this just gave me that extra push. Uh, I joined the Tarantula YouTube community kind of on a whim after I had made just a couple of feeding videos, very quick ones, and of course I filmed them in a portrait on my cheap cell phone. And I couldn't believe that there I was, you know, uh, with Exotics Lair and Dark Den and, you know, that, that, that I was in this group of people and they were all making videos and they were helping each other. And I made so many friends. And I remember talking to someone uh, in my personal life about how supportive everybody was and how much encouragement I got because I told them how scared I was to make videos. And they just kept saying, it's okay, it's okay, you can do it, you look great, you're, you know, you have a great voice, you're very pretty, you know, just all of these encouraging things. And at the time, it was what I needed. And I was able to grow from that and go through my own kind of growing pains and try, you know, trial and error to see what I wanted to do. And, um... You know, I didn't, I didn't know if I could, if I could incorporate my own sense of humor into my videos because I tend to be kind of quirky and I try to be funny, but it's not funny to everybody. I like to be philosophical sometimes. I like to be artistic, but you know, that really a lot of that wasn't working in my videos and they were veering too far off topic. So it took a while for me to really know what I wanted to do. To really know I played around with feeding videos I played around with rehouses now I I just rehouse my Ambalfori communal and my Ornithoctonus um, areotibialis I just rehoused them yesterday last last night I did not film it um, I do feedings all the time I don't film those I I just at this point that to me that's not um, that's not what I want to do I want to do something um, on my own that, that I feel committed, you know, more. I feel, I just want to do what I want to do. Just my own thing, but having to do with tarantulas. And so now I have enough experience and enough, um, I have so many more tarantulas I've had experience with. And I've spent so much time with them and so much time photographing them, videotaping them, observing their behavior, reading about them, talking about them. And I'm finally at the point where, hey, you know, I, I know these things I want to learn. I know these things that I want to share. So it's a very nice spot to be in. Um, and just whatever I can give back to people who are interested in who want to learn. And that's my objective. Um, so 
the YouTube, the Facebook groups, all the friends I made. Um, another thing that happened for me was that I was struggling a lot with socializing. And I mean, even in, up until a couple months ago, still, you know, even recently, still struggling with some social aspects of everything. And that has nothing to do with the hobby. That has to do with me and with a disability that I have. And socializing throughout my whole life has been complicated. I, I oftentimes, you know, miss cues, miss signals, miss, I don't know how to uh, fit in. I'm, I'm not aware sometimes of when I say things that bother people. So it's been a real challenge for me. But I'm finally, finally at a point where I've juggled so many different social relationships and situations over the past year that it's, it's given me that experience that maybe I would have had in high school but I didn't go to high school, which was probably a good thing because I socially, I don't think I could have handled it. But I think a lot of people, you know, they went to high school, they had all of these cliques and, you know, uh, vendettas and whatever, and they had to handle this somehow and come out the other end. Here I am now, decades later, and, you know, I, I, I have all of these different people and they all have their own struggles, they all have their own goals and dreams and, and all of these challenges and whatever they are facing and learning how to juggle all of that and learning how to respond to people and learning, okay, maybe this isn't helpful for me to say this. Maybe I just need to step away. Maybe I just need to whatever, but it's really been interesting and I've had to re- um, reformulate, so to speak, my approach and my thoughts about my socializing and skills and, and how I'm going to approach things many times and realize um, different things about myself that I didn't know. So it's forced me to look at myself a lot, a lot. And that has been very valuable for me. And so I think that this is something that I can take forward and use in my personal relationships and as I develop in other areas, you know, throughout life, you know, even when I'm spending time with my little nephews. And it's wonderful to have that, you know, because I come from a place where I didn't have that. So another thing I learned about myself is besides my confident my my self-confidence, I also had to learn that I tend to commit to something and say I'm going to do something and then I don't do it or I do it way longer in the future than I said I would. Or th And so I'm really focusing on overcoming this and, and having more structure in my life, adding more hours to my life. Like I've started getting up at 5 a.m. And I have routines and things that I do that I've changed because I want to see these things and I want to see them change and have different habits. So, you know, the, the tarantula hobby really led me to that. And it's just a great, great for being able to practice, you know, and being able to live. And I, I'm very thankful for this opportunity. Another thing that's happened for me after being in the tarantula hobby is, um, I don't know if you've heard of The Spinneret. This is a magazine for an, a tarantula enthusiast. And uh, they had a, um, their recent, um, the recent issue was about the M. balfouri. They had one about uh, Peace Lutheria species. Um, and I have been able to write and um, some articles and provide artwork for these. And then that has just been really great because then I am practicing writing again and seeing how challenging it is for me to put myself out there and to write something when I haven't really done that for a long time. It's really been on hold. So that's been interesting and uh, I'm really thankful for that opportunity. And, I, I think that's uh, just another thing that's very good in my life. So the other thing is learning about animals, you know, just overcoming fears. I'm learning all of these new things and I really love that. Uh, and, and it keeps me active and yeah, I mean, can I, can I really, I mean, you know, if you, if you are in the hobby, then you probably know the joy that I'm talking about. Uh, what it's like, you know, having all these variety of 
beautiful animals, you know, to, to see them every day and spend time with them and care for them. It's really invaluable. Not a day goes by where I don't see or learn something new. Um, and right now I have at this moment, um, 69 tarantulas. Um, and so that's where I'm at, um, 69. Um, I also have millipedes. I have some spiny stick insects, Australian spiny stick insect eggs um, that have not hatched. There are five of them, so those are being um, incubated right now. Um, and I have some isopods, just some basic isopods. Some are wild caught and I'm doing this little breeding project where I'm trying to select for color and that sort of thing. Then I have uh, dwarf whites and I have um, Dalmatians. And I did have a little Vietnamese stick insect and, and this one lived its life and passed away. I have uh, jumping spiders, wolf spiders, so, you know, have a, a few different creatures there. I um, also, I wasn't sure if I would take on a breeding project. I wasn't ever able to tell someone, hey, you know, yes, I know for a fact I want to do this. But uh, I was given a female Davis pentalorus, and um, then the person who gave it to me had a male mature and said, hey, would you take him as a loan and breed? And, you know, because there's a demand for for these slings. And so, yes, I said yes. And, and I'm nervous about it, but I will be doing my first pairing um, in a few weeks. And I do have someone to um, be there with me when I do this, just as, you know, extra precaution. The last thing that I want um, is for something to go wrong. And I have never sat through a breeding before. So knowing the body language of the tarantulas in that circumstance is not something I'm familiar with and I don't want to let my pride get in the way um, of, of, of this and, you know, sacrifice the male when I don't have to. So that is something I have coming up that is very exciting and this will really be, um, it'll be interesting. This year, uh, what am I going to focus on this next year? Uh, this year, 2019. So I have a lot of habitats that I'm going to need to upgrade since I had a lot of slings um, throughout this last year, 2018. A lot of them are juveniles now and they'll be moving over into uh, larger uh, habitats. So I will be adding a new, an extra, another shelving system. So that will happen. Um, my tarantula room uh, is going to be rearranged a bit because of that. Uh, I am going to work on a lot of artwork um, and some educational videos. I'm going to keep those up, the anatomy videos and some other things that I have planned. And I'm going to work on my follow through, I promise. Uh, and the breeding. Um, and I want to find my niche in the hobby with my personal connections, uh, people that um, I you know, fit in with that, you know, we, we can discuss things, that sort of thing. And, and I'm still, I'm still searching a lot for, um, for that. And I want to see where that goes, um, socially speaking. And that has a lot to do with me and, and how I, which direction I'm going to choose to go will have more to do with, with, um, you know, the connections that I make. So I'm looking forward to that. And also writing. Um, the last thing that I want to say here is that I, my whole life, I have wanted to write a book. And it started out that I was more of a fantasy fiction writer when I was young. But then some things happened and it's almost like I don't know, uh, something happened I couldn't uh, I couldn't really fulfill that dream and then I went into studying business and I became a good at business ease which you don't want to do that in creative writing it's a totally different style of writing and then I was a technical writer for a while for you know a place that tested substrate and stuff like that so that was more scientific I did that but 
I want to write something. I want it to be good. <laughs> so I'm doing that same thing that I do with everything else, which is procrastinate because I don't want to start something that isn't going to be good enough. And I'm closer. I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer. I've been writing. Um, and I think that maybe tarantulas will be a s central theme somehow uh, throughout um, throughout this this book. Um, I hope. Um, but anyway, I, I just want to say in conclusion that when we take on a hobby or we start something new, there is so much that can be taken from it. I mean, at first I kind of thought, you know, I'm, I'm keeping tarantulas, oh, it's kind of selfish of me. I'm just collecting these tarantulas for myself. And I had a lot of reservations too because, you know, I've worked in some animal rights areas and I know that, you know, a lot of people I know don't like the idea of animals being in, in, in pens and enclosures. And I mean, honestly, even myself, I wish that there were no domestic animals like ducks or cows. I wish they could all be free. But here I am keeping all of these tarantulas and I try to provide them with everything I can possibly think of and make sure that they're all happy and healthy. But just taking on this hobby and being this caretaker of these animals, I think is an honor. And I feel like it's done so much for me in so many, so many ways and so many places in my life and in my person that I can move on from this a different person than I was a year or so ago with a different outlook on life. And I started out with a grandma stole a poker pace. I had done a lot of research and wanted to get a very docile species. I uh, was a recovering arachnophobe. So it was important to me, you know, that I have a nice tarantula, whatever that means. And I did very quickly outgrow a lot of uh, my fears. That's been a wonderful experience and I'm really happy that I was able to conquer a fear like that. Uh, I was a person who had night terrors at one point. I was so scared of spiders. But now I, I, I know this is one of those things that uh, fear can turn into fascination and this was a perfectly suitable um, opportunity for that. And when you have this kind of situation, you have this, this feeling of confidence after you're able to overcome your fear. And it's very valuable to you as a person. When you overcome a phobia, it is a much bigger, it has a much bigger effect on you as a person overall. Um, and it really encompasses so many aspects of your life because you feel, well, I feel like I have this empowerment where I didn't before. Um, and it's just a confidence booster. I was really afraid when I first started my tarantula channel to even show my face. I was really self-conscious about it. And I don't, I don't really feel the same anymore. I feel more relaxed and I feel more confident and I feel more like I know what I want to do. And I think that that has to do with gaining experience and sometimes the only way to get there is to wait for it, to practice and learn and eventually you get there. There's really no way to fast forward and have that um, and have it be authentic. It's restructuring and I'm so excited. But uh, yeah, this is all my video thing can handle. So uh, I want to thank you uh, again for being here while I tell you about my first year. Much more to come.